This fourth edition of the Global Gender Summits is organized by the African Development Bank in close collaboration with the Multilateral Development Bank's Working Group on Gender and is hosted by the government of Rwanda. The first Global Gender Summit was held in 2012 in Istanbul, the second in 2014 in Manila, and the third was in 2016 in Washington, D.C. The theme this year is Unpacking Constraints to Gender Equality. The summits will focus on three key dimensions to achieve gender equality and women's empowerment, from scaling up innovative financing and fostering and enabling environments to ensuring that there are more women's voices and participation in development outcomes. Musa Faki Mohammed, Chairperson of the Africa Union Commission, Dr. Akiwumi Adishina, President of the African Development Bank Group, and other dignitaries. You may now be seated. Thank you again very much for this hearty reception. To all the gender champions in the room, you have just demonstrated that there will never be a new world order until women are part of it. Your Excellencies, Your Excellencies and spouses here present, honorable ministers, heads of delegations, members of the diplomatic corps, representatives of partner MDBs, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed, a very good morning to you. My name is Nafi Diouf. I'm a division manager in the communication and external relations of, um, at the Africa Development Bank Group, and I'm honored today to serve as your MC for the opening ceremony of the 2019 Global Gender Summit, the first to be held on African soil. As we all know, gender equality is a multifaceted problem, too big and too complex to be steered in silo. Together, we can lead the charge to a better future. However, we must move with speed to ensure we amplify the women's voices and scale up investments. At this point, we would like to air a curtain raiser video to set the stage before we proceed with the discussions. Two hundred years. That's what it will take to turn the gender tide and close the economic gap globally between men and women alone. We must accelerate the pace of change. We must surge ahead. We must irreversibly alter the status quo. It's the right thing to do. It's estimated that closing the wage and participation gaps alone will bring $28 trillion more into the global economy by 2025. Now, imagine a world. A world where men and women earn the same salary for doing the same job where women and men are equally represented in decision-making and leadership in the public and private sectors. The good news is that today, women are already leading the way in helping drive a quiet revolution to move from global commitment to action. Engineer Mara Kamiri is the first woman to hold a manufacturing management job at this Tunisian tech company. Je me sens très fière, très épanouie, très heureuse d'être nommée responsable MES. L'aventure a commencé. Young career women like Kamiri are rare in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in Tunisia and in most places around the world. Investing in gender equality lowers barriers to women accessing educational opportunities, health, finance land, social protection, strategic decision-making, and much more. Ensuring women have an equal voice. We're making progress. 
We're exploring innovative ideas to improve women's access to finance. We're creating an enabling environment where women are empowered and informed to ensure women's participation and that their voices are heard. Welcome to Rwanda. Welcome to the 2019 Global Gender Summit, a gathering of leaders and gender champions. Kigali 2019, it's our time. It's our moment to accelerate progress, to take a historic leap to make gender equality a global reality. Thank you very much. Now the, set is ta the, the stage is set. We heard it. We must surge ahead. We must shatter the status quo to make gender equality a global reality. Give us equal opportunities and we will contribute 28 trillion to the global economy. On that positive note, please join me in welcoming on stage the Honorable Minister of Gender and Family for Rwanda, Soline Nira Abimana, for her welcome remarks. Your Excellency Paul Kagame, President of the Republic of Rwanda. Your Excellency Saleh Wak Zeudi, President of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. Your Excellency the President of the African Development Bank. Your Excellency the Chairperson of African Union Commission. Excellencies First Ladies. Excellency former Head of State and Government. Your Excellency, former First Lady, Right Honorable, the Speaker of the of Parliament of Rwanda, Chamber of Deputies, Excellence, Honorable Ministers, Honorable Members of Parliament, Head of Regional, International, and the Member of, of Diplomatic Corps here present, CEOs here present, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Je voudrais d'abord exprimer mes sincères remerciements à vous tous, nos distingués invités, pour vous être rendus à Kigali pour assister à cet important sommet mondial du genre. Welcome to Rwanda for the fourth Global Gender Summit and thank you for your coming. I would like to express our appreciation to the African Development Bank in collaboration with the Machacho Development Banks for having chosen Rwanda as the venue for this important event. We are honored to host you. I would like to acknowledge some special guests who are here with us today and please stand up once recognized. I start by with the heads of delegations representing the heads of state from the following countries. Gabon. Mali. Maroc. Senegal. A Chad. A warm welcome to my fellow ministers also of gender from following countries. Niger. Somalia. South Sudan. Tunisia and Libya. 
Libya. Nous souhaitons également la bienvenue à Madame l'administratrice de l'Organisation internationale de la francophonie, représentant Madame la secrétaire générale. Vous êtes la bienvenue. Before I conclude, I wish to highlight that today is an international day for elimination of the violence against women. This is also marks also the start of the annual 16 days of activism against GBV, and that is under the color of orange, symbolizing the brighter future free of GBV. That's why tonight in Rwanda, here at the convention center, it will, this convention center will glow orange in honor to this campaign by Rwandans, in honor to this campaign by Rwandans and the GGS participants. On this note, Excellencies, distinguished guests, I thank you for your kind attention and welcome you once again. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. We can show our appreciation when she makes her way down. <laughs> Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, Kigali 2019 will, with no doubt, be a defining moment where women are escorted into a life that will never be the same. A moment where we collectively take that historic leap to move from commitment to action. At this point, I wish to welcome our principals, our esteemed members of panels, our dignitaries on stage. I'll be calling their name, starting with our dear VP, Jennifer Blanke, Vice President, Agriculture, Human and Social Development at the African Development Bank. Please, Ms. Polo Leteka, founder of IDC Capital, kindly join us on stage. I now call upon Dr. Akiwumi Adeshina, President of the African Development Bank, to join us on stage. Her Excellency, Musa Faki Mohammed, Chairperson of the African Union, kindly join us. Her Excellency, Saleh Wak Zewde, President of the Federal Republic of Ethiopia. And last but not least, a gender champion, our host, His Excellency Paul Kagame, President of the Republic of Rwanda. Thank you for that warm, gender-friendly welcome. It is now my honor and pleasure to welcome Dr. Akiwumi Adeshina, President of the African Development Bank, for his remarks. Your Excellency Paul Kagame, President of the Republic of Rwanda, Your Excellency Sally Wok Zide, by the Air Sister, President of the Federal Re Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, Your Excellency Musa Faki, Chairperson of the African Union Commission, Your Excellency Joyce Banda, former President of the Republic of Rwanda, Your Excellency Right Honorable Edward Ingerente, Prime Minister of the Republic of Rwanda, and members of the Government of Rwanda, Your Excellency Hele Mariam Desalin, former Prime Minister of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, and his dear wife, former First Lady Mrs. Desalin. Your Excellency Janet Kagame, the First Lady of the Republic of Rwanda. Please give it up to her. Your Excellency Margaret Kenyatta, 
First Lady of the Republic of Kenya. <laughs> Representatives of the African heads of state and government, including representative of President Macron. Honorable ministers, especially elegantly dressed today for the occasion, the Honorable Minister of Gender for Rwanda. <laughs> ministers of Gender from across Africa. Honorable ministers, ambassadors, heads of diplomatic missions, and international organizations, executive directors of the African Development Bank, representatives and staff of multilateral development banks, heads of commercial banks and financial institutions. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to the Global Agenda Summit. I wish to welcome all participants, ministers, and leaders from around the world to this event organized by the African Development Bank, together with all sister multilateral development banks and hosted by the government of Rwanda. This is the first time that the Global Agenda Summit is being held in Africa. I wish to thank you, Your Excellency President Paul Kagame, President of the Republic of Rwanda, for hosting us for this event. We are thankful to the government and the people of Rwanda for your well-known hospitality. I'd like to especially appreciate your dear wife, Her Excellency Janet Kagame, for her great work, and for all your efforts in driving issues of empowerment of women. Uh, Mr. President, you are known as a highly successful president, uh, but you have in her a great partner, and I believe that's why you are always succeeding. I'd like to welcome Her Excellency President Sally Zede of the Federal Republic, Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, my dear sister, Africa's only female president. For being with us, it's great to welcome Her Excellency Joyce Banda, former President of the Republic of, Rwanda, of Malawi, for being here with us. You are both great examples and role models for all women in Africa. Africa needs more female presidents. I'd like to welcome the First Lady of the Republic of Kenya, Her Excellency Margaret Kenyatta, thank you, Your Excellency, for all you do to promote the empowerment of women. <laughs> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I know it's a global gender summit, but I believe the issues that we will discuss are about women. I get gender issues, I get them. I know the numbers on gender disparities. The challenges are not just about gender. They are about underrepresentation and lack of empowerment of women, period. Let's focus on women. Let's focus on solutions for the gender disparities we see that affect women. I'm very proud to say I've always been a champion for women and women issues. Women are winners. Women are life givers. Every single person in the world was born by a woman carried in the womb for nine months, breastfed by a woman, carried on the back for your comfortable sleep as a child by a woman, clothed by a woman, and fed by a woman. Indeed, you could do nothing without your mother who gave you life. It is a great irony then that the same woman trusted to give us life are not trusted to manage the environment where we grow up. The bearer of life is now denied the basics of life. They are denied access to land. They cannot inherit spouses' property. They lack equal access to education or financial services. A world that denies women the opportunities to excel is not a smart world. The basic elementary thing we teach a kid is one plus one equal two. Clearly, additions give higher values, and subtraction diminishes value. So two minus one equal one. One will therefore assume that the world will be wise enough to know that things will be better with addition, not with subtraction. For way too long, women have suffered from the subtraction side, subtracted from education, subtracted from access to land, and legal rights over property, subtracted from access to finance, subtracted from leadership 
positions in boardrooms subtracted from political processes. No wonder the world is shortchanged. To change the world, we should go back to elementary school arithmetic and add one to one to make two. Women don't make wars. It's the egos of men that lead to wars. But men, women and their children bear the brunt of wars and conflicts. A world led by women will never have wars. Life bearers will never become life takers. Rwanda's women are a great example, a small nation decimated by war and genocide, which left its population with likely women. To rebuild Rwanda had to rely on women, and Rwanda's women are simply remarkable. They helped to rebuild this nation from the painful ashes of genocide and wars. Rwanda's women are strong, entrepreneurial, and determined. President Paul Kagame, my dear friend, recognize the power of women to build, to give life. Today, Rwanda has 50% of all ministerial positions filled by women, just like in Ethiopia. It has 61% of its parliamentarians being women, the highest in the world. Four of the seven Supreme Court justices are women. Today, present with us is President of Ethiopia, the first in her country's history and the only female president of the country, as I said, what an incredible achievement. As we gather today for the Global Agenda Summit, we must focus on how to fast track economic, social, and political opportunities for women and girls. A smarter world must invest in women and girls. Let's be smart. Let's be wise. Women are the best investments any society can make. When they earn, they spend 90% of their income on their households, including their husbands. <laughs> Her husband should be grateful for that. <laughs> Women pay back on their loans an overwhelming 90%. Smart banks will lend to women. Yet there exists globally close to $1.5 trillion financing gap for women-led small and medium-sized enterprises. In Africa, 70% of women are excluded financially. The continent has $42 billion annual financing gap between men and women. And women, who are majority of the farmers on the continent, face a financing gap of close to $16 billion. That's why the African Development Bank has launched the Affirmative Finance Action for Women in Africa, AFAWA, to, to mobilize $3 billion of new lending by banks and financial institutions for women in Africa, the largest sought effort in Africa's history. I would like to thank President Macron for his amazing support for AFAWA during the G7 summit. I would also like to thank Musa Faiki, His Excellency Musa Faiki, and all African heads of state for all their helps to mobilize $250 million, $251 million for the initiative. The African Development Bank believes in women. Women are bankable. Small, smart nations will invest in women. A study by McKenzie shows that equal and full participation of women can add an additional $28 trillion to global wealth by 2025, an increase of 26% in global annual GDP. So in short, the world is poorer because we exclude women or treat them unfairly in terms of labor market participation and unequal wages and unequal access or exclusion from markets and financial resources. As multilateral developing banks, we owe it to the world, not only to shine the light on the challenges of women, we must develop and launch transformative programs to tackle them decisively. We must drive policy dialogue to tackle legal regulatory and institutional environments that constrain opportunities for women. We must ensure gender equality in all of our projects. We must fight against gender-based violence. And we must expand voice for women to participate more actively in communities as leaders in project design, implementation, and monitoring. We must change our procurement systems to open up opportunities for affirmative procurement for women and for the youth. 
and we must end all forms of child marriage. For the men, hear me clearly, leave our girls alone. <laughs> Marry your own age mates. We cannot sacrifice the future of our girls. Let our girls be. Let our girls stay in school. Let our girls strive. Let our girls excel. They are our best assets. And as we deliberate over the next two days, let's remember one plus one equal two. Let's make sure we end gender-based disparities and inequalities. No bird flies with one wing. When we fully empower women, then our economies will fly with two wings. Our schools will fly with two wings. Our businesses will fly with two wings. Our communities will fly with two wings. And then women, the life bearers, will have much better lives to live themselves. And when they do, all lives will be better. Our world will finally fly with two wings, rising to the highest global wealth we possibly can achieve. Then our world will be a much, much better place. Let's support women to thrive. Let's make our world a better place for all. Thank you very much, and God bless you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Akiwumi Adishina, President of the African Development Bank Group. Always a very hard act to follow. I'll try to raise my game. So women are the best investment any society can make. Uh, on that note, I'm delighted to welcome our host, His Excellency, President Paul Kagame, for his opening statement. Excellency, Sahel Wak Zeld, President of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, Dr. Adeshina Akinumi, President of the African Development Bank, Excellency Musa Faki Mahamad, Chairperson of the African Union Commission, Excellencies, former heads of state and the government, first ladies here present, heads of delegation representing their heads of state from Chad, Gabon, Mali, Morocco, Senegal, and Uganda, honorable ministers of gender from throughout Africa, distinguished delegations, uh, leaders, and ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to welcome you once again on behalf of the government and the people of Rwanda. Rwanda is greatly honored to serve as host of the first Global Gender Summit to take place in Africa. I commend Dr. Adesina and the African Development Bank for spearheading this conference, working with the other multilateral development banks who are part of this effort. I also wish to congratulate the bank for the for important work on closing the multi-billion dollar credit gap for women-led enterprises in Africa. The launch of the innovative of our risk sharing facility will be a highlight a highlight of this meeting's outcomes. The fight for gender equality 
is really common sense. Women are our mothers, sisters, and wives, and daughters, a big part of which has been said by Dr. Dessina. Whatever women, whatever women gain, everybody gains and nobody loses. Indeed, let's remember that this is a gender summit. That means all of us are concerned, not just half of us. Being a man in a position of leadership at any level means never having to think about your gender. But being a woman leader means always having to think about how gender impacts your work. I think it is past time for men to become much more conscious of gender so that women can afford to enjoy the same freedom to just get on with the business that men take for granted. As was mentioned today, marks the start of the annual 16 days of activism campaign. Let's make them count. This summit is now open. Once again, you are most welcome, and I wish you a productive meeting, and I thank you for your kind attention. As you have noticed, I'm vertically challenged, so let me adjust the microphones. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, for that uh, inspiring speech and uh, call for action. I don't know if you heard it, but there's heavy downpour, and where I come from, when it rains, it only brings good luck. So it means that the proceedings ahead will be highly successful. At this point, I would like to hand over for the rest of the proceedings to our um, Vice President, Jennifer Blanke, who will moderate the high-level panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nafi. Okay, so the microphone is working. I am absolutely delighted uh, to be here today with such an incredible panel to kick off this discussion. I think we all see that we have some of the biggest advocates, if not the biggest advocates, in Africa for women's equality and really, you know, talking about but also doing what needs to be done in order to provide women with equal access on so many different levels and you know from government uh, from multilaterals uh, and also from business and i think the goal here is just to get a few of their thoughts to kick off discussions that will take three days that will be not just technical but technical as well as bringing in the voice of business and others uh, to really roll up our sleeves and make a real difference and walk out of here in the next three days knowing that we are going to move even faster and as President Edeshina says, accelerate uh, the move towards gender equality. So I would like to start with you, uh, Your Excellency President Kagame, if that would be okay. We've all seen the incredible things that are happening here and we just heard from you uh, how important you also see uh, gender equality uh, as a huge driver for development. And so, you know, obviously 50% of the cabinet are women, 50% of court judges, Supreme Court judges are women, more than 60% of parliament uh, in Rwanda are made up of women, that's incredible. So given how much you've achieved, what are your plans for the next stage, ensuring sustainable gender equality uh, in your country and really driving forward with that effort? Well, once again, let me mention how happy we are I am to have uh, the President of the uh, Federal Democratic Republic of uh, Ethiopia, President of the African Environment Bank, uh, Chair of the African Union Commission, 
uh, different uh, partners uh, here present, uh, Excellencies. We got it from the beginning that there is a lot of work to do uh, in terms of uh, narrowing uh, uh, the gender gaps that exist. So from the outset, uh, indeed, we made investments in terms of uh, making sure that women are a central part of uh, our population and uh, the growth of the country in every regard and development of the country. So we have achieved a few things. Good progress has been made, whether it is uh, women and their health, in education, in business, entrepreneurship. But there is still a lot of work to do. As we know, we are not yet where we need to be. And in fact, when you look at uh, the studies that have been done by, for example, the World Economic Forum, and as they show that uh, uh, gender parity has not been achieved by any country in our world. So we still have to do more, much as in some aspects we are ahead. Uh, we are on ahead where many people are not doing so well. So we, we need to, again, go back to business and work together to make sure that. But the other thing that is very important uh, for, for us in terms of the progress we have made and in which women have been uh, very active, uh, it's about change of mindset to understand and look at things differently in a way that matters. So the change of mindset has elevated women to the level where they need to be, and they are there uh, by their own efforts, as well as uh, the country altogether uh, making uh, this uh, effort together, men and women, and that's the difference that there has been. So what we intend to do, therefore, is to do more of what we have been doing and, and making sure that uh, narrowing this gender gap is everybody's responsibility. It's not just women's responsibility. It is theirs as well. But it is even men's responsibility and make, we have to make sure that this mindset, this new type of thinking is well entrenched and uh, just keep doing more of what we know has worked for us, uh, whether it is women, again, I, I'll give you uh, an example. In our history here, even going by the colonial laws and, and so on, women were not supposed to inherit anything from their families. In other words, they are not supposed to own assets, but we have changed that. In fact, women have uh, participated in changing that, even through changing laws. And as we have been told, they dominate the parliament. So sometimes when uh, uh, issues have come up and uh, they are complaining about this, we tell them, go and change it. Through the <laughs> you, have, you have the power in the parliament where laws are made, so go ahead and do it. And all we do is to support them and uh, support each other and make sure that uh, there is continued change. So good progress, more work to do, and uh, we are aware that uh, we have to work together to continue making the change that we want to see happen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And I'm not sure if this is working. Yes, now it's working, I think. Um, thank you very much for that. And it's true, um, it's amazing what's happening here. And 
uh, truly that will change the mindsets. And then it d does provide such an important example for other countries to follow. So talking about other countries, uh, Your Excellency, Madam President, I'm very happy to say, um, if I could turn to you now and talk to you a bit about the Ethiopian experience and drawing on your career, um, we see a lot is being done at the cabinet and other areas to try to make a difference at the political level in Ethiopia. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on there and also what are the plans going forward? What has your experience been uh, as the first female president coming into Ethiopia and seeing the changes that are taking place? Thank you very much. Let me start by um, expressing uh, the great pleasure that I have to be here today with you in Kigali, the heart of Africa. This summit could not be held somewhere else than Kigali, uh, the gender summit. Thank you, President Kagame, for the invitation, and President Adesina. Let me start by just uh, sharing with you a conversation I had with the president of the African Development Bank when uh, I got the invitation, and there were conflicting um, uh, uh, events. So I called and said, what do you think about it? And he, he gave me another question, saying, OK, very good. Who else do you want me to invite as a president in Africa? <laughs> it shows <laughs> how rare we are. So I mean, I didn't have to think twice. That's where we have to be if we can have our humble contribution to this conversation. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, Yes, 2018 has been a very momentous year in, in Ethiopia. Uh, we have also 50% uh, uh, of our cabinet um, who are women and other women in high positions and uh, of course including mine. This has been the result of um, overall transformation that uh, my country is going through since a year and a half and which has brought women to the fore. It has helped to see a new way of uh, having leaders, viewing uh, new leaders uh, as well. In the cabinet, we, we have also been able to see for the first time uh, female ministers overseeing ministries such as defense, national security, and so on. So I think we can say it was a very um, good momentum for Ethiopia, Ethiopian women, and for African women. Having said that, I want to immediately um, jump to the fact that the work has just started, but not finished. Uh, there is this um, um, perception, and in, in fact views that are expressed that since you have all these positions, then what else do you want? The, uh, the, the, what has happened in Ethiopia is the miracle of what a political will could lead you to. But the work has just started. I mean, uh, if it was appointing female representative to higher positions, then I think we could have done it long ago. Um, but there is this gap that we have to fill um, we have to have women filling, you know, those middle level leadership positions as well. And women grow along the ladder, competing with other male. So we need to have educated, skilled women that could replace those um, who have been pioneers in that regard. Uh, so the, the, the challenge is that uh, uh, we, we, we really need to uh, work uh, towards that and explain, change the mindset, as has been said, to allow women to come in. The other uh, positive thing, I think, of having women is that, uh, well, we can show that we can deliver, but uh, we can also deliver differently. There is no template to follow where we are, even in this position, be told, oh, no, 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 you know, this is how presidents act and this is how things are done. I said, okay, if I can get where I want to get different, in a different uh, way, so why don't I try it? This is the beauty of having different ways of looking at things and, and, and moving forward. So 
In Ethiopia, there is a door of opportunity that has been opened. It's uh, the onus is on, on us to maintain that door open because, mind you, it can be closed. We can regress. So we have to sustain this uh, great progress that uh, have been registered in Ethiopia in only a year and a half. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. And it is incredibly inspiring. Um, and again, yes, uh, we've just gotten started, but what a great start. Uh, so now I would like to turn to you, Your Excellency, Chairperson of the African Union Commission, um, because we know what a priority this is uh, for the African Union and particularly within your agenda 2063. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion, I think, uh, among uh, you and your colleagues about how violence and discrimination against women really does hold the continent back and that it is a very important uh, factor uh, to address in driving more, much more quickly ahead with Agenda 20, 2063, the SDGs and so on and so forth. So what I would love to hear from you is a little bit more about how you're working with African leaders to really make a difference in this area uh, and what are some of your plans uh, for uh, encouraging uh, gender equality in Africa. Thank you very much. Let me thank the President of Rwanda, Mr. Kagame, and President Adesina to associate ourselves to this very important summit on gender. I'm very happy to be those amazing African leaders from Rwanda, the President of Ethiopia, countries where there's a perfect parity between the members of the government. You're going to tell me that the African Union has 55 members, but we only have two countries where equality is maintained. But in our 2063 goals, even the equality of gender is written in with golden letters. So there is a discrimination, and it is political, it is economical, and it is social. Politically, it is not correct, economically not funded, and socially not justified. Statistically speaking, we have more women in Africa than men. And not to take this potential is a real waste. What are we doing with our member countries? The 2063 goal in its objective 6 says that we need to count on the women and its potential in Africa in order to achieve the goal. I've loved what uh, President Adesina has said and the figures he presented. He's a banker and uh, he did a great counting, especially when uh, you have to study the, the, the bankable project presented by the FAM. It was good that it was presented by the African Development Bank and its banker, Mr. Adesina. What we are telling our head of state, and I'm very happy to see that uh, everything gets better, and we need to say the truth and be courageous because it's in the interest of all the states to actually make progress significantly on the agenda. I'm from the east of Chad, and people used to migrate to Libya to work. I had an uncle that was going to Libya. I went with him to the station, the train station, and with his wife was there as well, so when they went into the train, she told him, be careful, be careful, save money, don't spend too much money, 
take care of yourself, of your goals and everything. I'm taking care, I'm taking care of the children and everything. Just please make sure that you save money. I'll take care of everything else. The leadership that that lady showed was amazing when his husband was living for two or three years in a, in a foreign country. This is the strength of the African women. So this discrimination cannot be justified. Violence. Violence is another issue. Violence against women is totally a big problem. No traditions, no religion can justify that women can be beaten. It's totally against any laws. So what I'm saying to the head of state is just enjoy this potential and make sure that you we are going to achieve our goals and make sure that uh, all those goals will be met, especially with the women. Excellent. Merci beaucoup, Votre Excellence, et on espère qu'il y aura plus, de plus en plus de chefs EFFE d'État euh, dans le futur euh, qui, qui peuvent euh, quand même euh, suivre ces exemples. Très bien. OK. Um, Dr. Adeshina, Mr. President, boss. Uh, I'd love to turn to you now, and I know that you already talked a bit about this previously, but I mean the numbers really are astounding. If you look at the loss in wealth uh, from holding women back by some estimates at something like 160 trillion dollars, which is about double uh, global GDP. Uh, so it's clear that there are gains to be made here by allowing uh, the two wings to function, so to speak. So can you tell us, you started a bit but can you get a, a bit more into detail with us about what the bank is doing uh, in this area and your sort of vision uh, going forward of how we can ensure that uh, Africa is really benefiting from all the talent uh, that uh, is at its disposal? Uh, thanks very much. Uh, first, let me thank the two presidents for what they said and also for chairperson of the African Union Commission. It's a lot of lessons there. Uh, first for me, before I come to the question, is the importance of realizing that progress has been made. Right? But then what they both said was the importance of humility, even as though that progress has been made. And also the power of mindset, as President Kagame said. We need to constantly change mindset. It's just exactly what the Chair of the African Union Commission just said. So I think we should keep those things in mind so that we keep it in perspective. Now, for us at the African Development Bank, and um, we decided um, about uh, almost three years ago that we have to stop talking about inframarginal things when it comes to women. We have to do things that are transformative when it comes to women. And so when we launched the Air Power, which is the Affirmative Finance Action for Women in Africa, which I said in my opening uh, statement, which is to mobilize $3 billion uh, for women businesses in, in Africa. That's a big thing for us. That's the biggest with anybody, I mean, we've ever had on the continent. But let me tell you why I did that, why I pushed for that. Because that's most important on mindset. 1992, I took a plane, a flight, from Lagos to Abidjan. It was in those days, uh, Air uh, Africa. And so I had a computer with me. It was the, this compact computer. It was one of those things you pick like this. It's like a suitcase. And that's all I had. And I entered the plane, and there are all these market women on the plane. And they had baskets on their head. They had clothes. They have everything. And just bear with me to learn so you don't judge what I'm saying. They all were very fat. And I couldn't find any place to put my luggage, I mean, my, my computer. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, I realized they started taking out the tapes. They had taped the bales of clothing around themselves because the customs people were cheating them so that they, you know, they were overtaxing them. 
And all of a sudden, they were all nice and slim, and they were all, everything was fine. And then the hostess came to me and said, what can I do to help you? I said, I'm just looking for a place to put my computer. And she turns to me and says, how many times do you fly this plane? I said, it depends on where my work takes me. He said, these women may look like illiterates to you, but they fly this plane twice a day to go and to come back. This plane belongs to them. So please make more room for the women and we'll put your computer in the hole downstairs. <laughs> now, then I realized as President of African Union Commission said that actually women run Africa. They run it. And so when I became president, I said, I can't think of anything more important than making sure that those women have access to finance at scale. And that's why and it's under your vice presidency, it's under you, and that's what we're doing. And we're going to talk about that maybe in the next panel. The next thing I want to say that we are doing, it's in the area of agriculture. Agriculture, women account for 75% of farmers on the continent. But 1% of land belongs to them. Rwanda is an example. It's making Ethiopia, also Ghana, and other countries. And Kenya are making good examples on that. 5% of extension goes to them, 10% of finance. It's not smart. I had a PhD student in 1992 who did his PhD thesis under me. And I remember he did a study in northern Nigeria to go and look at the impact of soybeans on, imp on women. Soybean was grown at that time by women, so men didn't care about it. But once it became a cash crop, the men went for it. And I remember the thesis very well. He found, the woman said, she was making so much money from, from um, soybeans. She said, look, the clothing that I'm wearing is from soybean. My kids go to school from soybeans. They are well fed from soybean. The house that you see, I built with the iron roof on it from soybeans. He said, soybean is my husband. What else does one need in a husband? <laughs> so that tells you the power of when you get land in the hands of women. It can transform things. That's why the African Development Bank, we are doing quite a lot to, on agriculture. We're spending $25 billion over 10 years and making sure all we do in agriculture is directed towards empowering these women. The third and final one I want to say is about fashion, fashionomics. You know, you saw the Minister of uh, 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 Gender of Rwanda elegantly walked down uh, as she came. You know, African fashion is fantastic. And globally, it's a $5 trillion market in 10 years. In Africa alone, $31 billion. But it's done lately by women. And so we want to make sure at the bank, we have something called fashionomics, which is to make sure that we are supporting these women that are doing the tissue, the couture, and all these things. And it's very, very important for us to continue to do that because you are going to impact a lot. Here in Rwanda, the government of Rwanda has a great program. So I think you call it, it's, it's the, is it pink orange or something that, that you have on textile? It's a company with Chinese company that is working here doing textile. Rwanda has that, uh, Ethiopia, uh, Pre Prime Minister Rezalin, I think you had on your, on your special zone, that uh, you are also doing textile, footwear, and all of those things. Now, these are very, very important things that we must really continue because fashion is a big thing, African fashion is on global scale, and women are the ones who run it. So we want to make sure at the bank that we provide them access to skills, to knowledge, to finance, to be able to be competitive globally on this. The last thing I want to say is about the issue of a program that you actually launched, which I like, is called 50 Million Women Speak. You know, you can have, uh, what do you call it, um, women, they're not so well organized. So access to information, access to mentoring, access to uh, markets, um, access to uh, finance and all these things. So what we've decided to do is working with the regional economic communities we set up these 50 women, uh, million women speak. So the women are connected, they are networked mm -hmm. you know, uh, with each other. And that will make sure that you know, individually, they may not be strong. When you got 
50 million women that are talking to each other, exchanging ideas, creating markets, creating opportunities, and lobbying for change, I think you will see a big change. So that's some of the things that we are doing. And I just, as I said in my remarks, I think the, uh, the best investment we can make as a bank is to invest in women. Thank you very much. And I'm quite excited to say that actually the 50 million African Women Speak is being launched right here. Um, and it will, it will be going live while we're here. So keep, keep your eyes open. And also we're going to be doing a lot on fashionomics and Afawa and everything. So very excited. And I think, Paula, that's a beautiful segue uh, to what you've been working on. Um, you've launched the Alatea Fund, of which we were one of the anchor investors, probably the main anchor investor. And we've been delighted to, to follow what you've been doing. But I think just... In general, you can talk about it all day if you'd like, but also in general, your experience as a woman working in the financial sector, um, which is very male dominated and can be quite challenging. Um, so it would be really wonderful to have an experience or, or have a, an explanation and discussion point a little bit about how you address these things and also for the heads of state and, and government ministers to hear a little bit about life, what life is really like on the ground. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, heads of state. Please allow me to say all protocol observed. In my country, we say that when we are lazy to, <laughs> to read out the whole list of important people. Uh, my name is uh, Polo Ledega. I am um, the second half of a fund called Alithea Fund that was anchored uh, by the African Development Bank. We're very thankful, uh, Dr. Adeshina, uh, for the catalytic role that the bank uh, has played, uh, well, played right at the beginning. But importantly, the, the, the supportive role that your team has really played, and I will tell you a little bit more about it. So in terms of my journey, um, I used to work for the South African government. I was actually responsible for the policy that many may, may know as the broad-based black economic empowerment. So I drove that whole process of uh, seeking to transform the racial makeup of South Africa's economy. You know our history, I will not bore you with the details. Um, so we had to be clearly very deliberate in ensuring that there's transformation racially, but importantly, and I suppose because the policy formulation work was led by a woman, we also made sure that women were at the center of that uh, policy. I'm giving you that background because I think it is important to acknowledge the importance of political will and uh, leadership when it comes to issues of transformation. You have to be very deliberate about it. You have to create you know, your regulatory environment and framework that enables uh, you, know, you to achieve the objectives of transformation, I think, broadly. So I, when I finished that body of work uh, uh, with the, the government of South Africa, I had already identified an opportunity in the market that the legislation was actually opening up opportunities for entrepreneurs broadly, black entrepreneurs broadly, but women in particular. Um, we often talk about how uh, sophisticated the, the financial services system is in South Africa, but the reality is that it's actually not responsive to your typical African or, or you know, black South African. So for me, there was an opportunity to actually establish a business at the time to, uh, to, to fac facilitate access to capital for black entrepreneurs and women in particular. This is in 2008. Um, so on the one hand, I had the benefit of a legislative environment that was supportive to what we were trying to do. But I think on the other hand, I was faced with a very hostile uh, uh, you know, sector that is male dominated, that is white uh, dominated, that is not used to engaging with a woman, that does not understand this opportunity that she sees uh, that requires to be educated and be, and be convinced. So that is the, 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 the typical experience, I think, of mo many uh, women entrepreneurs where you walk into a room, people don't really think that you've got a, a, a really commercially viable opportunity to talk about. Uh, I have found that the market, for instance, assumes that women run micro businesses that are slow growing businesses. And I think uh, President Adishina has just given you an example of how women are actually running the world. R girls rule the world, that is the reality. And uh, so, so convincing your traditional uh, investors, your traditional LPs, that there are decent sized and high growth businesses that are run by women at the time in South Africa and of course later on when uh, the, the African Development Bank invited us to have a conversation about broadening, broadening uh, finance to women across uh, the continent, uh, we also found that uh, 
having that conversation with the international investors now going beyond Africa, I mean, we spent, Tokumbo and I uh, spent about three months in Seattle in 2016. Just to give you a, a, an idea, we started this conversation in 2014. Uh, the FDB convened a meeting in Nairobi in 2014. I remember the exact date, 28 April 2014. And it took us five and a half years to convince the rest of the world that women as an asset class are worth investing in. We had to change the language uh, that we spoke about. I mean, when we started, we used to say we wanted to raise a fund that invests in women-owned and led businesses. And uh, you know, your investor base would say, also, oh, are you impact uh, investors? And we said, well, if you want to call us that, that's what we will, we will answer to that too. Uh, and over time, we found that we needed to change the language so that we could make our male counterparts on the other side of the table be comfortable with what it is that we, we were saying. We had to develop uh, what we now call a gender, uh, um, a gender lens investing tool, which uh, we were hoping to launch fairly soon, um, which, uh, which also tries to put in a language that, again, the world is used to, to, uh, you know, for them to understand exactly what it is the value proposition I is that we're trying to put on the table. So it, I'm, I'm just demonstrating to you how much education, how much advocacy has also had to go, go into us convincing the world that investing in women uh, actually uh, makes their commercial sense, despite the fact that many studies have actually proven that there's alpha. Uh, in fact, uh, that there's, 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 there's even better alpha in investing in women than when you just invest in, in men-owned uh, uh, businesses. But it also took, I found that it's very useful to have a sponsor. Uh, Dr. Kagame, you spoke about um, the issue of including women, not just being a women issue, but actually being a male a, a problem. We found that having sponsors, again in the form of the AFDB, where they would literally go to meetings with us. So Tukum and I would be the girls, and then there would be a guy from the AFDB. And for some reason, that somehow brought us some currency that we didn't have when we walked into the room on our own. So although it is not ideal, but I think to the extent that you've got men in power, in positions of power and influence, who can actually stand up with us and for us and help us to tell the story and open the doors, for me, I think we should never shy away from that. It's not a sign of weakness on our part. I think it's just a sign of where the world is and the fact that we need to walk this path together until we change the mindsets that we spoke about. So. Mine, as, a, as an entrepreneur, has, has been that kind of journey, with the, and, and we've been able to open a lot of doors, I think with a lot of support, but I think what I've also found, and I think it is important for every entrepreneur, whether male or female, to know is I have found that when you're authentic, when you are a subject matter expert in whatever it is that you are selling as a product, or if you are very clear about the problem statement or the problem that you are trying to solve, and you're also very clear about how you're going to uh, solve that problem, you very quickly break down the barriers that you face because we, we, you know, we continue to, to face barriers. But I think when you're authentic and you sound like you know what you're talking about, people are willing to take the, the, the chance and are willing to actually uh, back you and invest uh, uh, in you. So um, the AIF for me is a continuation of this journey. I'm very excited because uh, one of the most significant things that it, it now allows us to do is to actually bring to life this uh, inter-regional uh, trade agreement that we've signed uh, as, as, as most of the continent. Because we, talk, we keep talking about uh, the, the need for inter-regional inter uh, trade, but we hardly ever see anything happening on the ground. So Tukum and I are very clear that the one thing that we're going to pursue very, very uh, aggressively is the opportunity to, to, to make linkages or find linkages between uh, businesses within the SADC region and, and businesses within the West African uh, region. So very thankful for that opportunity. Thank you. And thank you for mentioning the Africa Investment Forum, which indeed is all about changing the way that we look at things from sort of an aid mindset to an investment mindset, which is the way we need, know we need to go. Now, I'm mindful of the fact that we don't have much more time, but this is such an excellent panel. I would love to still get at least one last thought uh, from each of you, even briefly. Um, and just segueing uh, from what we just heard from Polo, uh, Madam President, I would love to turn to you again and just ask you, what uh, advice would you have for young women in the room who are thinking about uh, pursuing leadership, uh, you know, which might seem very daunting, but you know, what, what advice would you have for them if, if this is something that they are interested in? Okay, thank you very much. My first point would be to let them know 
that there is no Africa we want, there is no progress on this continent if they are not included. Now is the time they have to seize it. This is the call that I would like to make. I would like also to tell them that they have to believe in them, they have to believe in what they can do. There is a lot of mystification. We have to go outside those. The path to leadership is about learning, is about growing. The path to leadership is also paved with many mistakes. You tumble, you fall, but you rise, you learn, you apologize, but you move on. We cannot stop. Let me tell you, as women, we put the threshold very high, and we want to be 100% perfect. We have to face the risk. We can't, and others didn't get 100% as well. So we have to be really ready for, for, this, for those challenges. We need to be focused. We have to know really what we uh, really want. But it's also very important, beyond believing in our capabilities, by the way, we can, young women nowadays have more capacities than the, the current one that they have. Let me tell you what has happened to me, my, my own experience. I have worked in my national capacity as well as one decade with the high positions in the multilateral system. So whenever I was proposed a post, the first reaction was, who, me? Like, uh, would I be able to do it? We have to take that away. You can do it. I have asked those questions, but I managed, I think I have. So I, I, we have to go beyond that. There is no restricted area for women nowadays. We can be, we can work anywhere in what could contribute to the society. But above all, really women will have to contribute to the fact that we have now, it's the time to move from rhetorics to action, from words to deeds. It's not only in big rooms, conference uh, uh, halls. We have to go to the grassroots. That's where things happen. We have to, to have that humility as well to, to see all along the ladder and, 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 and bring them up. We, we talked about fashion. I mean, this weekend, I, I went to visit some amazing Ethiopian designers who were in an incubator. It's amazing the potential that we have and what we can take from our own um, assets. I mean, there is so much collective wisdom on this continent that women can br bring forward. So the time is yours. <laughs> Don't waste it. I think we will have to work all of us together. But let me conclude by saying women working together, it's a formidable force to be reckoned with. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now that is extremely powerful and I will just repeat that for the young women in the room. Dare to be not perfect because that's what it takes when you're moving forward. Uh, Mr. Chairperson, uh, Your Excellency, um, just turning to you very briefly to get a sense from you how you think that working together between the African Union Commission and the African Development Bank, we can really move the needle on uh, improving uh, gender equality. I would like to say that the African Development Bank is in charge to put together the investment so that we can make the 2063 goals. So this initiative is very much welcome. We have launched an initiative which is 1 million before 2021 through education entrepreneurship for the ladies so that we can give the women uh, the opportunity to promote themselves. We have actually 40% of the women within the African Union. The head of state said that we have, we have to reach a 50-50 percent uh, parity within the African Union. 
and, uh, and itself. We are at the end of the decade of the women, 2010-2020. So personally, I'm going to continue to advocate so that the 2020-2030 will be the decade to mobilize the financial condition of the women so that with all these elements we can build on what we have achieved between 2010-2020 and continue on this road. Merci. Thank you. Thank you. And we will work together, and we will do great things. Of that, I'm convinced. And actually, my teams were just with your teams recently, and we have great plans. Um, so, Polo, uh, turning to you, and we've heard uh, from the president of Ethiopia some of her sort of uh, words of wisdom uh, to the women in the audience who are thinking about leadership. Turning to you and your experience uh, in the private sector, what would be your words of wisdom uh, to young women who really uh, want to uh, break into this area and make a difference, uh, particularly in the, whether it's finance or business, um, what would you tell them? I think uh, very much in line with some of the words of the, uh, the president of, uh, of Ethiopia, you need to start. I, I think um, entrepreneurs and women in particular tend to want to spend too much try time trying to perfect and, and you never get around to starting. And, and I always say that the market is the best um, giver of feedback. So when you start, the market will immediately tell you when, whether you're onto something good or whether you should change it uh, 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 you know, as quickly as possible. And I think the earlier you can pivot your business idea, the better it is for you because you don't uh, waste too much time and you don't lose too much money uh, uh, in the process. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, turning to you again, Mr. President, boss. Um, you've talked a lot about how a bird needs to fly with two wings. Uh, you've mentioned it again today. Again today, We've heard from some of the uh, very impressive women on the panel what the recommendation would be for women who want to take up positions. What would you tell men that they need to do in order to make this happen? Uh, thanks, Jennifer. I think the first thing is I think men have to realize that the, the current problem was not created by women. We created the problems. So we have a greater responsibility, as President Kagame was saying, to make sure that men in positions of leadership help to redress, readdress long-term injustices and inequalities that have actually been perpetrated down for so long. And so when you take a look for me, I think the importance of mentorship the importance of uh, support and importance of promotion, promoting women, it's very, very important. Now, in trying to do that, you know, like in the, uh, I remember, you know, in the, in the uh, U.S. elections uh, the, the, the last time, uh, Hillary Clinton was talking about the issue of the glass, uh, glass ceiling. I think the glass ceiling is an easy thing in the sense that you can still see from there, because it's glass. In the grace of Africa is not a glass ceiling. It's a concrete cement. You can't... <laughs> <laughs> so, so it requires a bulldozer to bulldoze right through that. <laughs> and so I think that uh, the example we have, excellent example, President uh, Kagame is an excellent example you know, he just explained to you what he had to do. Right? I think he's too modest for his achievement. That's just because of who he is, right? I think you should give, it, give him a clap because it's... <laughs> and I think that this is what it takes, leadership that redresses long-time injustices and equality, inequalities. The other thing I want to say is President of the African Union Commission said it and also the Minister of Gender from Rwanda mentioned it. It's the issue that we have to do everything to end gender-based violence, rape, gender harassment, and all these things that go on. It's not because we don't have it on the law books. We have them. But the police have to do their jobs. The, the, the courts have to do their jobs. There has to be high penalties. 
uh, for these things that, as you said, abnormal things that we are trying to normalize in some situations. I also think that for girls, we have to make the homes safe. We have to make the schools safe. We have to make the streets safe, the work environment safe, you know, so that they can actually thrive in those uh, uh, environments. And I just give one thing about, about our programmatic intervention. Just a small thing like providing safe toilets in school. We invested in Malawi, Madam President. We had a project there with our partners. We put about $23 million just to provide toilets in school. And what we found, toilet and water and sanitation, was that girls were dropping out of school just because there are no safe toilets for them to use. And when it was time for their periods, they go in school, everybody making fun of them because there's nowhere to go. And it affects, as uh, uh, you were saying, their psyche, the, the, the confidence and everything. So we invested $23 million there. You know what we found, Mr. President, was that the enrollment in school went up by 29% for the girls, 29%. We also found that diseases in terms of water-borne diseases fell from 36% to 5% just from that. So I think that these are very practical things that we must do to own that. But I will end with one thing that we are here talking about the imbalance, men, you know, women largely. But I, I perceive that unless we change something, We'll be here in another 15, 20 years talking about how to change another imbalance for boys. You go to schools today, universities, and you look at their graduation. First class honors, when they ask them to come, they're all girls. You should clap for that. That's good. I went to a university in Nigeria. I was there for the, for the you know, uh, graduation ceremony. And they say first class honors about seven times. All the people that came were all ladies. Then we were all filling all the best prices, about 15 of them were taken by ladies. So we were all sitting there, really bemoaning, where, just find us one boy, one guy, it's not. So finally one guy gets up and the whole place went up and we were all excited. And the guy came in, they asked him to get the price and then go over and say thank you. And he said, well, you know, it is actually was won by my girl, but she fell ill, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> so I think that we need to really make sure that <laughs> we don't enter this. Our girls have a lot to teach our boys so that, you know, we don't come back in 50 years and we find that it's the reverse. So I think a lot will also learn from the excellent performance of our girls and, and ladies in school. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And Your Excellency, President Kagame, I would love to give you the last word. Mm. What can you leave us with today? Well, um, I would say there is uh, a lot of learning to do. There is a lot to learn from, so let's keep learning uh, all together. Second, we must do things that we can do. And we know that uh, we'll bring the change. Therefore, learn, do, change, and measure so that uh, we are able to tell where we have come from and where we are uh, at the present and uh, where we could be going forward in the future. Uh, and just the last uh, thought is that, like today, we, we, we are having uh, this uh, uh, gender summit or the number of days for activism for that. Uh, I think we, we must give a, a good and real meaning to the activism. Activism is not just uh, making noise and... Uh, and yes, and being excited, and I think <laughs> activism is also about management, management of the expectation, uh, proper management of what is doable, and identify relevant things you ought to do, 
uh, and uh, get more organized and really be deliberate and, and do the things that are even within our means to do because there is a lot that is within our means to do that we don't do. Uh, so I think this is what I can uh, finally say. Excellent. Thank you. So, learn, do, change, and measure. I think those are wonderful words to leave us all with. Over the next three days, this is what we will doing, be doing. Um, and I'm sure that at the end of the three days, we will be very excited uh, with what we have mapped out uh, for the road ahead. So please, can I, we have a round of applause for this amazing panel. Thank you so much to everyone.